welcome to another of Orinoco Tribune special episodes on Palestine. And uh, we are having uh, Khaled Barakat back with us for the maybe third or fourth time. I don't remember, but yeah, it has been different times. And we are very honored that he is back again. So it has been more than 200 days since October 7, 2023 when the Palestinian resistance carried out the daring Al-Aqsa flood military operation against the Zionist state. The Hamas-led operation involved a dawn raid on the occupation military bases surrounding the Gaza Strip and taking hundreds of settlers as hostages. The Al-Aqsa flood shattered the occupation's complacency in its rather, I would say, baseless belief of invincibility that was backed by the U.S. empire. In response to this defeat in front of the whole world, the Zionist state unleashed a genocidal war against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, which has been going on for more than 200 days now. The occupation's war planes have bombed schools, hospitals, churches, mosques, and turned to dust entire residential areas in Gaza City and in other urban centers of the Strip, killing nearly 35,000 Palestinians and injuring more than 77,000, while some 100,000 people remain missing, buried under the rubble of their homes, many of them probably dead. So close to 70% of the dead and the wounded are children and women. And the entity is trying to execute population as a final solution to the Palestinian question. So in tandem with the Western Bloc led by the United States is carrying out a global information and psychological warfare campaign to justify the crimes of the occupation. The governments of these countries are also repressing all forms of support for Palestinian struggle inside those countries. So this is in addition to the US and its allies delivering plane loads of military aid to the Zionist entity. It seems that in spite of massive international solidarity for Palestine and opposition to the genocide, the settler colonial occupation entity and its master, the US empire, are intent on ethnically cleansing the Holy Land of its indigenous population. However, Palestine is not without its own allies either. So in defense of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian resistance, the forces of the axis of resistance in West Asia have been providing crucial support with Ansarullah in Yemen, the popular mobilization units in Iraq, and Hezbollah in Lebanon, striking US and Israeli bases in the region with missiles, drones, and rockets. And to this, we have to add the recent military strikes against the entity carried out by Iran, the first time that the Islamic Republic of Iran has struck such deep inside the occupied territories. So in this situation, Orinoco Tribune considers it essential to look at various aspects of the Palestinian cause and the Palestinian struggle, the current situation in Gaza, and why Palestine should be on the anti-imperialist agenda globally. So to discuss these issues, we have with us, I would say, our returning champion, Khaled Barakat, Palestinian writer and activist, currently based in Canada, who is associated with Masar Badil, Palestinian Alternative Revolutionary Path Movement. A leftist and revolutionary voice on Palestine, he has been the target of numerous smear campaigns in the West, aimed at silencing and criminalizing him and others like him, fighting for the Palestinian rights in the diaspora. In 2019, he was deported from Germany from his activism. Meanwhile, in Canada, he has been a target of threats and harassment coming from various quarters, including the parliament. So Khaled, thanks a lot for being here again and uh, you know we, the honor is all ours it's my it, it, it's my honor and uh, it's good to be back with you it's good to have you again and of course we should i i, I know that uh, since if we talked about palestine we should be having you every day but uh, we, yeah. we cannot do that but okay so we'll start with something that happened a bit earlier in this month. So I think towards the beginning of this month, the Zionist entity announced a partial withdrawal of ground troops from Gaza Strip after six months of war. So do you feel this as a victory of the Palestinian resistance? Or do you think it is how the Israeli prime minister has claimed that the withdrawal was for rest and recuperation before invading Rafah? Or do you think the Zionist entity is running away from its defeat in Gaza and escalating against Lebanon and uh, Syria? Yes, uh, this is actually a very important question because uh, why would the Zionist army uh, and the Zionist uh, leaders announce 
the uh, withdrawal uh, and tactical withdrawals, and they call them all, give them all kinds of these names and titles. In reality, the Israeli army is devastated and very tired, and they have been failing in achieving their objectives uh, for the past seven months. And so the Israeli army uh, is being exposed, not just as a failure army, but that they possess all these capabilities with the full support and participation from the United States, Britain, Germany, France, and yet they are uh, failing in, uh, in Gaza. This uh, shows that the Palestinian resistance is still strong, and at the same time, uh, the minute the Israeli army withdraw from any area in Gaza, in less than 24 hours, the resistance are back and organizing not just the military action, but also organizing people um, and the social sector, the education sector. And so they're back in full force. Uh, this has been also uh, noted even by uh, Israeli commanders who have resigned or who are threatening to resign, saying that they have failed in uh, Gaza miserably. Uh, also, the these tactical withdrawals is just because they wanted to replace these divisions with uh, you know reserves uh, and with uh, and new uh, divisions because they're trying to uh, give some rest to these soldiers who have been actually, uh, you know, um, devastated and with a very low morale. Um, we have seen also how Israel was trying to push some of these um, religious um, groups and uh, especially the Haradim to enlist them in the Israeli army and they are refusing to serve in the Israeli army. If they force them to do that, you can imagine what kind of soldiers they're bringing to Gaza, uh, you know, uh, with no um, experience and no uh, morale, no uh, readiness to, to fight. So these so-called withdrawal tactical, uh, you know, um, withdrawal, it's... Uh, it's just a sign of weakness. This is how the Palestinian resistance see it, and this is how all military experts are actually seeing it. Okay, so that's, uh, I would understandable that it will be like that. So I just uh, uh, give over this to Talal, who would uh, like to ask you the next question. Yeah, the, the second part of this question is a long question, but the second part is about the um, the escalation in Lebanon and Syria that we've seen, um, you know, over the past few months, but it's it's definitely escalated over the past month, the bombings in Lebanon. Um, if we compare this historically, we saw in 2006 when Gilad Shalit was um, successfully captured, they tried to invade Gaza, they were unsuccessful. So then, then there was the operation from the Lebanese border where they captured some more Zionists. And so they said, okay, well, we can't win in Gaza, so we'll go attack Lebanon. Then they failed in Lebanon. Do you see that right now they're going to continue escalating against Lebanon, potentially another invasion in order to compensate for their defeat, as you correctly pointed out, uh, in Gaza? That is also an uh, important question because uh, it shows actually how the Israeli army uh, have no trust with the political leadership and vice versa. There is a, a huge division in the internal front in the Zionist entity, and they cannot carry on uh, a full-scale war or qualitative escalation with Lebanon. They understand that the resistance in Lebanon is very strong. It's uh, 100 times stronger than the resistance in terms of capabilities uh, in, uh, you know, in, in Palestine. And also they understand the readiness of the Lebanese resistance led by Hezbollah uh, in terms of their, uh, you know, uh, the, the 
decision and the readiness of the Lebanese resistance. Even if Israel escalate, the resistance in Lebanon will escalate. We saw that yesterday and the day before yesterday where the uh, Hezbollah fired uh, missiles and uh, um, drones, uh, military drones to Akka, and that is almost 35 uh, to 40 kilos inside Palestine. At the same time, the Lebanese resistance understand that this might be an option that Israel will take. And so that's they they have been mobilizing the their capabilities, their fighters to um, to be ready for this scenario. Now, what uh, the Zionist enemy is doing, uh, they are waging a war against uh, Hezbollah uh, commanders, uh, assassination policies, uh, particularly uh, in the South. And Hezbollah has been, uh, you know, on this battle particularly, took a strategy of announcing the martyrs uh, and... Uh, you know, uh, express, uh, uh, you know, uh, full uh, support of their families and, and, and you know, introducing uh, their names and their, you know, work in, uh, in, in the resistance without any kind of uh, hesitation because they, and they meant to do that. Uh, that was a strategic uh, decision that they made. Uh, one, because... Israel lies about, uh, you know, like yesterday they said, we have killed half of the uh, commanders of Hezbollah in South Lebanon. And of course, this is a lie. And at the same time, Israelis are hiding their casualties in terms of the number of casualties that they have lost in Lebanon. But at any rate, uh, the Israelis said that there was four uh, thousand missiles in the last 200 days uh, fired from Lebanon. Our assessment that Israel have lost uh, up to 3,000 uh, soldiers uh, between killed and injured in uh, the south front or the north of Palestine uh, front. I don't think Israel wants to escalate to a full-scale war simply because the capabilities of the Lebanese resistance. I mean, let's remember that the general secretary of Hezbollah, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah said, he said, I just want to tell the Israelis two words, Ghosh uh, Dan. And Ghosh and, and Dan is the name of the area where Israel, Israeli uh, petrochemical, uh, you know, uh, electric uh, uh, industries, uh, very high-tech industries. And it's in one area in Palestine that Hezbollah could destroy in matters of a couple of days. And Israel will crumble if that happens. Now, of course, the Israelis have a very strong army and they are being supported fully by the United States. I mean, the U.S. is fighting in this war. They're not like just supporting Israel. They are uh, very much involved. But at the same time, there is a, there's a strong resistance. They're going to have to deal with the outcome of any aggression on a full-scale aggression against uh, Lebanon. At the same time, there is no more one front will fight by itself. The that those days are over. Today, there is a camp of resistance in West Asia. It is united. If Lebanon gets attacked, Yemen, Iran, Palestinians, Iraqis, uh, Syria, they will be all fighting in one front. That uh, time where Israel could single out one area is over. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's uh, the unification has been really inspiring and, and incredible considering the 
significant campaign over the past few decades. I mean, a hundred years, right? Like over a hundred years since Sykes Picot yes. splitting the Arab nations, splitting the Islamic nations. Um, so with that, mm -hmm. I guess a follow up is what do you see as the impact of Iran's Operation Truthful Promise that happened recently um, on the war situation generally and this, you know, unified fronts, as well as the morale of the people um, for Palestinians, as well as uh, the region in general, um, the Arab masses um, in the surrounding countries? Yes. Two-part question. Um, <clears throat> we have to look at this battle uh, that started on October 7th and with all its ramifications, with all the uh, the repercussions that happened and the change uh, that created in the area uh, as a Al-Aqsa flood operation. And then we have to look at this qualitative step that were taken by Iran on April 14th as the second wave of the battle. Uh, which means that the not because Iran strike on Israel, Iran could always have always been able to strike against the Zionist entity. But the way Iran did it in response to Israel aggression against the Iranian territory, the Iranian embassy in Syria, uh, a symbol of sovereignty, but at the same time, Iran launching um, a, uh, an, a, an attack uh, that uh, was that happened from the Iranian territory, from Iran, declared in advance, like they meant to say that we don't want to have the element of surprise. We are attacking you, and you better know this. And they even notify some of these countries uh, in the area 72 hours before the attack. Uh, and this was a, a big challenge for the United States because the message is to Israel is that no one is going to protect you or wage a war against us because of you. And that you cannot, as the Zionist entity, fight by yourself. You need a caretaker and a protector and guardians and shield. But regardless of all these military support that you're getting, regardless of all of these uh, US, UK, French, German, and others who comes in your help, those two airports that uh, you use to attack our embassy are going to be destroyed. And they did that. Uh, the other thing is that they set a new rules of engagement in terms of Israel was basically conducting all these assassination against Iranian scientists, assassination against leaders in the Revolutionary Guard and in, uh, you know, targeting Iranian facilities inside and outside uh, Iran and never claimed it because they're coward and they always do these criminal acts uh, and try to shift the cards, uh, shuffle the cards and say this is uh, ISIS or this is this or this is that. Everyone knows this is the Mossad. Their fingerprints is all over the crime scene. To the extent that they have literally uh, planted bombs against civilians who are participating in a rally commemorating the life of General Qasem Soleimani, killing, you know, tens of people, innocent people. Um, mostly they're there to show their uh, sorrow and pain and, and pride on one of their uh, leaders. So now Israel cannot do this anymore without expecting a reaction and uh, punishment. When Israelis carry crimes, there has to be a punishment. And if the world is not ready to punish Israel, we will. That was the Iranian message 
in April 14th. And this has set a new um, stage in the battle of Al-Aqsa. How do you see the Palestinians and uh, Arab nation interpreting this? Well, I say the vast majority of the people of the region welcome the uh, Iranian strike. In fact, it was a popular demand by the Iranian people and by the people of the region that Iran should not use this theory of strategic patience uh, when it comes to being attacked on its sovereignty, uh, attacking the Iranian embassy, killing, you know, uh, uh, more and injured more than 14 people is not acceptable by anyone. And so Iran have the right to defend itself. The people of the region also understand very well that when Iran do this, uh, it actually uh, are saying we are ready for, uh, you know, any measures that will be taken against us, especially uh, economic sanctions. And uh, there is a war against Iran on this front. But there's another thing that ha that happened. Iran exposed the Arab reactionary corrupted regimes in the area by this strike. And that's why, you know, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, all these states feel cornered because of what Iran uh, did. I don't think that was the Iran uh, objective is to expose them, but naturally any resistance action in the area will expose these reactionary forces. Thank you for that. It's very insightful. Sahali, if you would like to ask the next question. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yes, it's, uh, I, I understand that. Uh, and, I mean, the Jordanian army, I mean, the King of Jordan, whatever you call it, the administration of Jordan uh, supported, I mean, it became a shield for the Zionist entity, shooting down Iranian drones even. So it's really, it was a big exposure of all the reactionary regimes in the region. I mean, we knew, but it was for all world to see. Anyway, I've like returning to the situation in Gaza after the six months of war, I just like to ask you what is the situation on the ground for the people who are living there? Because I remember that since childhood, I have heard that Gaza Strip is an unlivable place that people cannot, I mean, it's uninhabitable. And this time, the Zionist entity even declared that it wants to render the region uninhabitable. So how are the people living in the region now after six months of a continuous bombardment? And then there are the people who had fled to the south, I mean, who were forced to flee to the south. And then they, were, they tried to return and we heard that there have been like bombs and missiles raining down on these people returning to their homes in the north. So what is the situation of these people? Have they been able to return or are they stuck anywhere? The situation in Gaza on the ground uh, is very devastating because uh, there's nothing uh, literally uh, left in Gaza that Israel did not uh, destroy. They destroy the universities, the hospitals, the infrastructure, uh, there's nothing really you, you, you can think of that Israel did not destroy or uh, partially destroy. But one thing that Israel couldn't destroy, and that is the morals of the Palestinian people in Gaza and their steadfastness that our people in Gaza understand Israel's objective behind these war crimes and genocide is to displace them and push them into exile in order to um, pave the way to do the same thing in the West Bank and against our people even inside 1948 occupied territory. What Israel wants to do is to not just do uh, another Nakba, because the Nakba has happened in 1948 and it's continuing. But this is a cycle 
of a Nakba that is worse than what happened in 1948. And at the same time, they want to pave the way uh, and the roads to their relationship with Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates and some of, you know, this uh, right wing fascist governments in the area, in India and others uh, areas in order to do business. They want to have these big projects that will link the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. They want to have projects where they can have these, uh, you know, um, uh, building infrastructure for Israel to benefit and to be the exit of the Arab world and West Asia to Europe. Uh, they want to dominate. And if you go back and look at what Netanyahu said in the United Nations, one month before October 7th, you see how he was talking. He's arrogant. He's like, we can do whatever we want to, basically. That was his message. And October 7th comes and blocked all of these schemes and will send Netanyahu to the dustpan of history. And uh, there will be no normalization in the same way that, you know, they have been doing that. They're retreating the wheels and the vehicles of normalization is is being pushed back but on the ground the palestinian people in gaza have lost everything except their faith and their principles and their support to the resistance in fact all new uh, polls have showed that the support for the military resistance in gaza have actually been uh, higher today than it was ever before. Why? Because our people in Gaza understand who is besieging them. It's the United States, Israel, and Egypt, and some Palestinian collaborators, capitalist uh, collaborators who who's in Ramallah serving the Israeli occupiers. Our people in Gaza also understand that surrender is not an option. Our people in Gaza and their relationship to the armed resistance is the relationship between flesh and blood. And they cannot, Israel with all its crimes, cannot turn the Palestinian people in Gaza against the resistance, simply because these fighters are the sons and daughters of these people. And it's not like, you know, these fighters are coming from Mars or some other galaxy landed on Gaza. They're our brothers and sisters and our friends and our families. So so they Israel is, is failing on that front. Yes, they are killing people. Yes, they are destroying uh, uh, you know our uh, infrastructure and, and, and schools, uh, but they're not uh, winning on the ground. They are definitely losing. It seems um that this basically this campaign of specifically targeting the infrastructure is part of a pressure campaign to force the resistance to surrender um like basically that these are threats oh if you don't accept a ceasefire that would be a ceasefire on our terms or surrender as uh, the resistance has correctly pointed out um, then, you know, then we'll invade Rafa, then we'll destroy Al-Shifa Hospital. And, you know, they, they publicize it. It's disturbing. They, it's almost like they're proud of their crimes so they can use that. Um, what do you see as, like, could you give us uh, an overview of what the ceasefire negotiations are, the prisoner exchange negotiations, what they have been, and the role of the the media, especially the Arab media, in all of this? Well, you're right in terms of uh, they want to pressure the resistance in order to surrender. And in the worst case scenario for them, uh, or best case scenario, I don't know, is that, that they can get whatever they want to uh, through these pressure uh, you know, in terms of uh, Palestinian situation to um, Palestinian people to feel as if they achieved nothing 
and the Palestinian resistance to be in a situation where it, it will have a crisis. For the, and this is information uh, that I know from firsthand sources in, in the resistance in, in Gaza. One is that the capability and the willingness and the readiness of the resistance is to fight for many, many months and years to come. And so this message has been sent clearly to the negotiation uh, team in Cairo, is that we are in a good shape as resistance, military resistance. In terms of uh, people position, our people in Gaza, the vast majority of our people in Gaza, what they want to see is four things. They want to see the siege being lifted, they want to be able to go back to their homes in the north, particularly, and, uh, you know, the displaced Palestinians, internally displaced in Gaza, to be able to go back to their homes. The rebuilding uh, of Gaza and at the same time, uh, the exchange of prisoners. We want to see our political prisoners uh, achieving their freedom. There will be no concessions on any one of these four things. Uh, so Israel is going to have to deal with how it's going to respond to the lifting of siege. But this is not just a question to Israel, this is a question to the world. Uh, Gaza has been under siege for 17 years. And... Uh, we believe that the outcome of this battle is going to be ending of the siege. At the same time, Israel have put itself in the corner when they say that we want to attack Rafah, and they made Rafah to be the last card that they have now. And yesterday, the resistance forces were telling Israel, go ahead if you can, but be prepared to pay a very heavy price if you invade Rafah, and you're not going to get any concessions from us or from our people. And that's because there is a trust between the people and the resistance, and our internal front in Gaza is very strong. Can you imagine that in the last six months of war crimes and genocide, and our internal front is unified in Gaza? Have you seen anything that indicates a weakness in the Palestinian internal situation? They were trying to do all kinds of criminal schemes against our people in Gaza, the CIA, the Israeli uh, collaborators, uh, the PA in Ramallah, and they could not tamper with our internal front because it is very strong and it's very united across the board. And so these four demands uh, uh, and conditions by the Palestinian resistance, we are going to achieve it. We, we, know that, we know that we will, because Israel is in crisis, not us. That's, um, that's very significant and something we don't hear very often is that the resistance is, is really winning um, despite everything. So thank you for emphasizing that. Um, the kind of follow-up question of this regarding the fourth demand is what is the current state of the Palestinian prisoners movement? Um, so recently we know that Walid Daka was murdered in prison through medical negligence. We know that this is a, a martyrdom, a, a specific murder, and there are many other prisoners who have been murdered. Um, you know, what is the state of the prisoners movement it's a crucial part of the struggle what the palestinian political prisoners are facing these days we have not witnessed that in any time of our uh, history a struggle against imperialism and, and zionism for the past 100 years we have prisoners these days coming out without legs and without hands we have prisoners uh, that have been assassinated and executed on the spot. 
mean, Israel is preventing any kind of communication with the prisoners. And on October 7th, there were almost 5,000 Palestinian political prisoners. Now we are talking about almost 10,000. They have arrested 14,000 uh, prisoners. Uh, and of course, they had to release uh, some of them in the West Bank and from Gaza. And what they're trying to do is to terrorize our people in the West Bank because most of the prisoners are from the West Bank and from you know, Jerusalem. So they're trying to terrorize people that if you, uh, you know, because they're targeting student leaders, uh, you know, uh, women leaders, uh, labor union uh, activists, uh, writers, uh, you know, artists, and those who have influential uh, uh, role locally in their refugee camp, in their village, in their city. And at the same time, they are rounding up children, but no one is talking about this. When you talk, when you hear, you know, any of these uh, UN sessions, or the Security Council sessions, these, uh, you know, uh, statements on uh, first, you know, the release of Israeli hostages, but nothing on the Palestinian prisoners. When you compare uh, the situation of the Israeli captured and the Palestinian prisoners, there's no comparison in terms of how our people treat uh, the Israeli captured uh, and and that is obvious and and it's the natural thing to do because we're the opposite we're not we're not like Zionist when an Israeli is under uh, our um, you know mercy uh, they will be actually free uh, free we liberate them uh, and they understand that uh, Palestinian resistance is not about, um, you know, killing Israelis. Uh, it's about liberation, and it's about achieving our uh, rights and our freedom. Yet, when Palestinian prisoners are released, they are more committed to continue the fight against the occupation because of what they saw and that what they witnessed inside prisons, the torture and what have you. At the same time, I think it's very important that to see that what the Israelis, uh, the way they are treating the Palestinian prisoners, always uh, doesn't give them any kind of benefits. It only exposes the true nature of the Israeli uh, Zionist project in Palestine, and that the people uh, will not be scared from participating because they were tortured. People actually, their commitment to the resistance uh, becomes more deeper because they were tortured and because they were humiliated. And they understand that this Israeli system is, is going to have to collapse. Otherwise, it will be always a nightmare for our people. And that's why it's important to uh, talk about Palestinian political prisoners also not as their victims and you know like just from this from this uh, angle we should see them as the leadership of the of our movement and we are very proud of them and their steadfastness and their commitment and their organizing even with all these harsh conditions in prisons they are uh, organizing themselves and sending a message of steadfastness uh, Would you to speak our more movement. on that organizing well, because we have no communication with the with political prisoners and they're preventing Israelis are preventing them from seeing their families, their lawyers from Red Crescent. We have been in similar situation, not on this scale, but similar situation where they isolate prisoners and, uh, you know, attack them and uh, uh, try to break their uh, will. And the Palestinian prisoners have a very rich experience you know, fighting uh, these uh, prison conditions for the past 76 years. It's not something new for us. And so uh, part of the organizing, for example, inside uh, prison is to focus on helping and assisting the prisoners from Gaza uh, who are inside prison. And so the solidarity inside prison is focusing on 
prisoners who are coming from Gaza and children. Uh, and it's very important that uh, children becomes very uh, a priority for Palestinian uh, political prisoners in order to provide for them the support that they needed. And what we're finding out, especially when some of these children were released, and they were talking about how much they were supported by the, the, the older uh, political prisoners. But at the same time, the stories of children, Palestinian children assisting elder, uh, uh, especially the you know uh, uh, people with the illness or who are going through you know health conditions, that these Palestinian children are actually becoming uh, a supportive force uh, for them. This organizing is 24/7. Uh, at the same time, the Israeli prison authority is on the top of that authority is Ben Gavir. And we know that this is the uh, uh, you know a fascist uh, Israeli minister who said just last week, the prison, the prison is crowded, and maybe the only way to solve this problem is through executions. And inciting against Palestinian political prisoners, despite even their harsh conditions, but they're proposing, uh, you know, executions, uh, and to start executing uh, uh, prisoners, uh, you know. But they did, they did in the last six months. They have, uh, and we don't know all the information yet because some of these, uh, you know, cases is not, uh, is not, uh, you know, known. But that's that's the situation, and uh, and as I said, the the you know uh, we are expecting also to have a more pressure. Uh, uh, on the Israeli prison authority, uh, especially from international uh, agencies, and we have been trying to uh, to put that pressure. But unfortunately, the United States and uh, Israel allies are a shield uh, for Israel, uh, protecting it from any accountability uh, in term uh, regarding Palestinian prisoners. Is that that's something we have seen that international organizations seem to not work when there is U.S. culpability anywhere involved. And in case of Israel, it's actually U.S. I mean, I can understand that Israel is a sort of tool for the empire to continue its hold in the region. So you mentioned like, among your among the demands, you also mentioned the West Bank. And especially the prisons, most of the prisoners coming from West Bank. So, since they're prisoners, it means that there are also um, also organizing and resistance going on within the West Bank, right? So we can see. I mean, we can see it from the reactions of the Israelis, especially the settlers, who are escalating their anti-Palestinian pro pogroms in the West Bank. So. At the moment, is West Bank becoming a major front of the Al-Aqsa flood operation? Absolutely. And we see the rise of the Palestinian resistance in the West Bank, uh, especially in the north uh, parts of the West Bank, like Tul Karim and uh, Jenin, Kalkilia, and Nablus. And at the same time, we see a rise in, uh, in terms of resistance actions uh, in, everywhere in the West Bank, really. Um, but one important issue is that to remember about the West Bank it, it is that it's literally under siege, not in terms of the entire area, but every city, every village is surrounded either by settlers or Israeli military camps or both. And the people in the West Bank is not just facing Israeli atrocities and crimes conducted by the Israeli army, but also by the criminal gangs of the settlers, sorry, that enjoys the Israeli army protection. And so we see how these crimes carried by settlers is completely 
covered and supported by the Israeli uh, army. The other issue is that our people are facing the Palestinian Authority uh, oppression. So you can imagine how people uh, living in Pantostans besieged in every village and city are fighting these three forces in order for them to carry on uh, their daily life, really, uh, and at the same time be able to resist the occupation. But despite all of these conditions, uh, we are expecting uh, that we are going to witness an intifada in the West Bank. And Palestinians are more open now to the uh, call for the liberation of the West Bank and not for a Palestinian state in the West Bank. It's more realistic to talk about the liberation of the West Bank, meaning the dismantling of the Israeli colonies in the West Bank, the withdrawal of Israeli army from the West Bank without giving any political concessions to the enemy. And so more younger generation are going to adopt, in my view, the goal and the objective of liberating the West Bank, uh, with, of course, the support of the camp of resistance and of all the alliance, um, Palestinian, you know, alliances, especially uh, the resistance in Lebanon and uh, Iran. And we see also that Jordan is playing a very reactionary and dirty role, really, because they're trying to block any kind of support for the West Bank that comes from Iraq or from Lebanon or from Iran, uh, especially on the armed uh, front. Uh, so they have been playing the same role they played since the inception of this uh, fake state called Jordan, and that is to protect Israel and to protect the Zionist enemy. That has been the role of Jordan since day one, and it's continuing until today. As a follow-up, um, with, you know, we've seen protests in Jordan, massive protests in Jordan for like a month now, maybe more. And uh, recently, I believe Kataya Bezbolov offered to arm them. I don't know if you saw that, to arm the protesters. I don't know if that was a real offer or not. Um, what do you see as, you know, it, it seems to me that the support of the, like if the Jordanian regime were to fall, that would be a huge blow for the American occupation of West Asia and the Zionist entity. What do you see as the future of these kind of evolving consciousness of the Arab masses in Jordan um, and in Egypt? I think we are going to witness a new a uh, wave of uh, revolutionary wave in the area, it will change the situation to 180 degree than what the enemy wanted in the last 15 years under the so-called Arab Spring. And that is we are going to witness that these demonstrations, these revolutionary waves are going to happen inside the monarchies in Morocco, in Jordan, in Bahrain, in these areas, and it not to destroy our societies in Morocco or Bahrain or Jordan, but actually to get rid of these regimes who have been an ally of Israel, an ally and puppets of the United States. These regimes that is playing a very, um, you know, um, have a very strong role uh, and being an obstacle in front of Palestinian liberation. The other thing is, is, is worth noticing is that in Jordan, you know, over 75% of the population are Palestinians. And the vast majority of the people of Jordan consider themselves Jordanians and Palestinians. And the relationship between the two people is like the relationship between, you know, um, the people of 
Pakistan and the people of India, for example, on a people, the people to people level and not country to country level. Uh, especially when it comes to historical roots and not necessarily these days. Uh, and that we are one people. Uh, the only thing between us is this river. And so that's why when the spokesperson of the resistance, Abu Ubaidah, said that we are from you and you are from us to the Jordanian masses, that's exactly what he meant. And the same like an hour later after his speech, people were in the streets, which means that the masses are responding to the call of resistance in Jordan. And if any other political party in Jordan called them out to go in the streets, they will not respond. If the king himself <laughs> asked them to go out in the street, they will not respond. They responded to the resistance. And this is very important. We also saw how they were cheering for the Iranian missiles and drones going, you know, to uh, attacking the Zionist entity. The people of Jordan were very happy. In fact, they wanted Iran to strike the embassy, the Israeli embassy in Amman, and they were chanting that, you know, you know, uh, to 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 uh, to attack the embassy in Amman. What the Jordanian regime is worried about is that today there is a rise in the resistance camp in the region, but particularly in Iraq, because it's their neighbor. And that's why the, the, the capabilities of the Iraqi resistance could actually change the equation in Jordan. And I hope, I hope it will. And I hope that the, the resistance would start uh, doing these campaigns uh, by um, actually practicing armed struggle because uh, Jordan and Palestine have the longest uh, borders, 360 kilometers, you know. Uh, and at the same time, there is a popular incubator for the Palestinian and Arab resistance uh, in, in Jordan. And the relationship between the people and the regime it's 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 more tense these days because of the economic and social conditions of the of, of people in general and they see that the king and the royal family are having you know uh, all these uh, uh, what kings have uh, you know uh, palaces and 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 controlling over uh, economy and what so, so on and so forth and people are hungry. Literally, there are a, a very dire situation in, in Jordan. All these are going to play uh, uh, in the favor of the Palestinian uh, people uh, and the liberation uh, project and, and the camp of resistance. And that's why Jordan is doing what they're doing. Jordan is an occupied territory today by the United States and, and France. You know, there is so many U.S. military camps in Jordan. Friend, France have literally like uh, airports in Jordan. The, you know, who gave them the right to be in Jordan? The people of Jordan? No. Uh, it's the king. Uh, and the king is benefiting from, the, from these bases in Jordan because they can protect him. But I don't think that the, you know, Jordan is going to remain the same in the coming few years. I think we're going to witness qualitative changes in Jordan. Mm -hmm. Inshallah, it does change. That's been a long time coming. Okay, so you, since you mentioned Jordan, I mean, there is, I call it an Arab Zionist regime. I mean, the king of Jordan, the royal family of Jordan is an Arab Zionist regime, like many yeah. others in the region. So I'll just I think you, this is a sort of associated question and I think you answered it poetly. So I'll just um, ask you about the other Arab Zionist regimes because, you know, recently, I mean, in the, I think in his latest speech or maybe in, in some other place, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, that is Said Hassan Nasrallah, he said that the myth that the that Israel controls the US, it was created by certain Arab regimes. So I think he was referring to Jordan, of course, but uh, the Saudi, Qatari, and Emirati regimes also. So my question is, I can understand about Jordan. So I mean, just broaden the question and ask that 
Why do all these Arab Zionist regimes collaborate with the Zionist entity? Like, what sort of benefit do they get in return for being collaborators and you know, betraying their own brothers and sisters of Palestine? Well, because these Arab Zionist regimes, I'm going to start using this phrase now, uh, uh, the, they have um, the relationship with the United States in order to be strong. Historically, the U.S. has been pushing them to normalize. And it created this idea that if you want to have a good relationship with the U.S., it has to go through the gates of Tel Aviv. This is, uh, uh, you know, um, Arab regimes, uh, classic argument why they want to have a relationship with Israel. And even those like surrounding Palestine, particularly Egypt and Jordan, who have signed pacts and so-called peace agreements with Israel, benefit nothing out of these peace agreements. What did Egypt benefit from the Camp David? What did Jordan benefit from the Wadi Arab Accord? What did Palestinian benefit from the Oslo Agreement? Those who signed so-called peace agreements with Israel, they benefit nothing. And if you look at the situation in Egypt today, on the education, on economy, on all of this stuff. Now, if we go to the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, these forces who wanted to have and actually have an alliance with Israel and the so-called Ibrahimi Accords, what did they benefit from this? What did the United Arab uh, Emirates are going to benefit from uh, you know, having an alliance with Israel to protect itself from who? If Israel cannot protect itself with its own army against the Palestinian resistance and against the Lebanese resistance and Yemen have, have actually imposed a, a curfew, uh, a, a naval curfew, a sea curfew on Israel. If you go today to the uh, you know ports of uh, Elat, there is nothing uh, there, no business. And that is due to the Yemeni brave military forces. Now, Israel is going to protect United Arab Emirates from Yemen. Yemen could tomorrow, uh, you know, uh, start shelling Dubai, turn it into a rubble. Uh, you know, they're cities of glass and sand. It, it won't hold, you know. And so are they going to protect the United Arab Emirates from Iran? Iran was very clear that if these territories are being used to attack us from Saudi Arabia, from United Arab Emirates, from Bahrain, we will strike these uh, territories. And so can Israel or the United States actually protect these monarchies and these Arab Zionist regimes. It can't. And this is what Al-Aqsa flood operation and this battle and uh, the camp of resistance is proving every day. No one can protect these regimes, not Israel nor the United States. And this is very important because when you look at people position. Let's take Bahrain, for example. The vast majority of our people in Bahrain are with the resistance, not with the regime. The vast majority of our people in Jordan is with the resistance, not with the king. And in Morocco, when you see hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, is that is that not an indication that th these people have a clear position supporting the Palestinian people and the resistance and not, you know, King Muhammad al Khamis. And so this, the situation is shifting and the balance of power is shifting, but it will take time. It's not going to happen in a matter of one or two years. 
you know, it's quite interesting when you mentioned that part that the, the U.S. is sort of brainwashes this let's say the leaders of these regimes that if they want to have good relations with the US, they need that needs to go through Tel Aviv because that is exactly the same thing that the United States imposed on India in 1993. That if, because before that, India was most, more dependent on the USSR, but when it's gone, so like nothing, India was not a, uh, not a member of the World Bank, it was not a member of IMF, etc. So how are you going to get this loans and stuff? The United States said, oh, you will get this, we will let you enter these organizations, these international financial organizations, supposedly multilateral ones, but they're mostly controlled by the US. So that if you want to get into these organizations, it has to go to Tel Aviv. So in 1993, India normalized relations. I mean, recognized. Even before that, it was not even recognized as anything. So it recognized and it started a diplomatic relations. And it took us to what it is today. Like you have a you have an Indian Zionist regime ruling the country. So yes. the, I mean, this is exactly what happens to all these, I mean, or will happen to all these regimes when they go on normalizing relations with the entity. I mean, that's that's we have the um, we have the experience and we can see that this is exactly what is going to happen to these regimes and they will probably fall before the Indian one falls because it's more complicated, but I can understand. I mean, I can see that this is, ex I mean, this is very similar. I mean, the United States has only a few, what it called, guidelines that it uses everywhere, the same copy paste everywhere. So it's exactly that sort of thing. It appears to me. So since we are talking about the regimes and the region, I'll just go and broaden this thing to ask you about the significance of Palestine in the current geopolitical scenario in the globally. And this is not just related to Ansar Allah, Hezbollah, the Iraqi resistance groups, and even the governments of Iran and Syria who have been the natural allies of the Palestinian resistance. So, well, we can what I can see, I mean, what we have seen in recent months that Hamas and even Ansarallah have been received and treated as political parties by the Russian government, the Chinese government. Like it's not like these are in power really. I mean, they're in de facto power, but there is no election either in Palestine or in Yemen. I mean, there are no conditions for that. So we can I mean they're in de facto power, but they do not have really I mean, diplomatic relations or anything. And still these groups, I mean, the, these delegations have traveled to those countries and they have been received as normal political parties. There were nothing like, oh, these are terrorist groups. So uh, there was also a very publicized vote in the UN Security Council on Palestine's UN membership, like complete UN membership. So what impact do these developments and do you envision on the geopolitical scenario involving Palestine and vice versa. That is, what is, it's mostly what is Palestine impact on the geopolitical scenario that is evolving, not just in West Asia, but I would say even globally. Yes, because the reason, I mean, this is a very important question because the reason that Palestine is so important as a cause for the people of the region and the people of the world, even before, uh, October 7th and more so after October 7th, it's because Palestine signals the balance of power globally and the power, the balance of power regionally. So, and everything related to Palestine, it's by default related to the Zionist entity as well. So if there is a war, then everybody gets affected and the, the 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 waves of effects it's felt immediately worldwide but particularly in our region and uh, west asia as a very important area in determining the global system and so for example we see that today uh, there is turkey and qatar and other forces in the region who have very good relationship with the U.S., even NATO. And at the same time, they are trying to push the Palestinian people and the Palestinian resistance into accepting, um, you know, the two-state solution, for example, or trying to get concessions from the Palestinian people uh, through, you know, the 
stick and carrot policy. Uh, and you see other camp in the region led by Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, who's using the stick against the Palestinian people and harsh measurement. And then you see Iran that is supporting the Palestinian people and the Palestinian resistance. So the, these three camps actually exist globally, not just in our region. And the fight that it's happening in Gaza is you have the global south literally pushing for Gaza victory because it's pushing for its own victory. And the Western imperialist uh, power are supporting Israel because they support their interest. And so this fight is not just between Palestinians and Israelis, as uh, you know, it is two international camps are actually in this conflict in a time that a new world order is needed. People cannot live with the United States determining the fate of people and the fate of uh, the world. And we see this on a daily basis, how there is more uh, multipolar system are being, uh, you know, uh, born. Uh, and this is very important. And so uh, Palestine could be utilized by some uh, reactionary forces uh, to benefit their reactionary policies. And of course, Palestine could be supported by other forces that could signal the birth of a new world order that can protect people resources and push U.S. hegemony and Western hegemony over our areas. And at the same time, the United States must accept the fact today that the world is changing and it cannot rule the world. And the empire is shrinking, it's getting weak, and we are going to witness more and more internal crisis in the United States uh, that Palestine is there and have a lot to do with. And if you look at the intifada of the students today in the United States in campuses, you can see the relationship between what's happening in Gaza and what could happen in the United States and in the really of the beast. And so for those who think that the battle in Gaza will remain in Gaza, that's not going to happen because of the geopolitic position that Palestine uh, actually uh, could uh, effect. And at the same time, it makes international forces like China, Russia, uh, even India could now have, uh, the, the, and I mean progressive forces in India and revolutionary forces and voices in India could see that there is another option. We don't have to be under this fascist you know, regime uh, uh, in India, but actually India could be playing a major, major role. Those who support the Palestinian people are actually playing this major role today worldwide and in geopolitics. But those who are not supporting Palestine are actually on the sideline. Even if they're so, you know, like 110 million people in Egypt and a very you know, like uh, Egypt with all of, of what it represents is on the sideline because they're not supporting the Palestinian people. They look at them as a, as a tool for the Zionist and for imperialist. The minute Egypt liberates itself, Egypt will become a major, major force in determining the situation in the region. And that's why Palestine is that uh, factor uh, for people to wake up, to, re to rise, to revolt, and to have a real spring. And we need a real Arab revolutionary spring, a spring that it's compass Palestine and not any other thing. There's, um, there's the, uh, a very good article in Al-Akbar that was recently, which is that uh, we must transform from the people of the Arab Spring to the people of Al-Aqsa Flood. Yes. Uh, the sentiment, you know, that uh, that's yes. that's really important. Um, yes. 
I, I have so much I would like to ask you, but <laughs> I know you have to go soon. Unfortunately, I, have... I have to go, but I would love to continue this discussion all the time. Uh... I I have um one last question for you. So we know that there is a huge gap between the Arabic media, specifically the pro-resistance Arabic media and the English mm-hmm. media. Um, thankfully, you know, there is a, a new emergence from like al Mayadeen English and Press TV have done a major job in spreading pro-resistance yes. uh, news in English. Um, part of Orinoco Tribune's goal is to translate and to bring news from, you know, most of our news is Spanish translations into English. So if you were to speak to an international audience of English speakers, because, you know, unfortunately, due to hegemony, English is a kind of a global language for many, um, many people around the world. Um, what would you, what would you want to emphasize that people, um, that this English speaking audience can take away uh, to learn to, to, to change or, um, you know, some of dispel some of the myths or what, what would you want to say just to this, to cross this bridge, this barrier? Yes, uh, th- this is the central question that will actually, I mean, to, to actually deal with it, uh, we need to uh, have history and the present time uh, alive at the same time. So people un- need to understand, for example, uh, that the relationship between Arabs and Iranians from a historical context, it's not the same as, you know, in 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 like uh, the, as if we have to choose between this uh, historical relationship with brothers and sisters who we share with them. Uh, culture and philosophy and history and food and all of that to compare this to the relationship of a Zionist Western settlers uh, colony that is 75 uh, years old and that we need to choose between Iran and and Israel Uh, you know for some people the reason they don't understand this is because they don't know the history so we have to work on how to bring history into our uh, living days and, and, and how politics could be affected by understanding this historical relationship. Uh, and so, for example, this is a responsibility of the revolutionary intellectuals and of the resistance itself. The task of the resistance forces is not just military struggle, but there is the cultural front that we need to work on. And this is a very important front. And not just news. You know, we want to put the news into context from, you know, why Iran is supporting the Palestinian resistance. If someone says, well, because Iran is responding to its national interest, well, that's good. What's wrong with that? As if it's this is an allegation or something like, you know, we should shy away from. Of course, they're working to secure their national interest, but they're doing this also not at our expense, not at the Palestinian national interest. We have a common, I think, this is not just political choices or how to say it in English in a news uh, cast. This has to be worked on from a historical uh, context as well. The other thing is that how do we present our position to the English speaking world has to be by uh, calling uh, out their ignorance and say, you know, you have been fed all this garbage from your Fox News and CNN and all of that. And why don't you have an open mind about understanding the East and the West Asia and, you know, India, China, Iran, uh, Palestine, understand these areas. And I think the younger generation are getting it. 
And that's why we see the results of reading uh, the English uh, language resistance uh, uh, material and the actions of the resistance as well. The support of Yemen has and the Yemeni's uh, armed forces. I see it every time I go to a demonstration. The minute you chant for Yemen, people just respond in support of Yemen. But we want to tell them we also must learn one or two things about Yemen. And so to not just to support an action, but to also have Yemeni study center, Iranian study centers in universities push for more knowledge in depth uh, and not just the 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 surface. We must because we have oh, so much mind, to offer. If you don't mind, this is one of the things that I have found is there's so much deep seated anti anti-Iran and anti-Yemen ideology amongst all sectors of society in the English speaking, well, in the West specifically, but the, the English speaking media has done so terrible. And it's disgusting. Yes. If, if it's been incredible to see at least some of the transformation that has occurred as the material circumstances have changed, you know, a year ago, if you said, um, we support the Islamic revolution amongst a group of socialists in, you know, the West people be like, oh, all right, I don't know what you're talking yeah. about. But yeah. today, if you say we support unconditionally the Islamic revolution of Iran, you might still get some pushback, but I mean, it's, it's changed. Um, so it's I'm learning that. Delal, just look at the international Al-Quds Day. We used to be like four or five cities celebrating and commemorating. <laughs> right. Now, 3,000 3, cities and towns and villages across the world. That's a signal. This is, gives you a signal that where people conscious is, where people awareness is. And, and, and it, it could have not happened without the steadfastness of the Palestinian people, of the people of Iran, of the people of you know, uh, West Asia. This is... This is something that people contribute to, even though they don't, they don't. Uh, and our role in the West is the most important role in this equation, because the supporters of the resistance are the one who's going to transform, uh, to, uh, trans, you know, to translate the uh, the resistance position to the Western world. Thank you so much. I think uh, I think that's all of our time. Thank you very much for having me again. I am sorry about the time situation. Uh, I feel embarrassed. Uh, no, no, please, please don't feel embarrassed. I mean, it's okay. We can understand. I mean, this sort of thing happens. So it's not like uh, this is something out of the blue. Or, I mean, we don't have means to manage it. But anyway, uh, thanks a lot. Still for still coming because it's very it was very early for you to come so thanks a lot and i do i uh, do agree with you that education and consciousness is reaching people or rather education is reaching people and then people are becoming conscious about palestine about uh, well about west asia in general about yemen because a lot of people even within the arab world were not aware of yemen or considered yemen as uh, an enemy i think it was I think it was a sort of uh, result of the Arab Spring because it's very interesting that <laughs> Arab Spring did not touch these Arab Zionist regimes. It touched those that were actually supportive of the Palestine, Palestinian cause, Palestinian resistance and liberation. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that that is changing, even if it takes time, like you said, but it's still changing. Mm, and yes, with the Al Quds Day celebrations, there were even marches in many parts of India, despite a sort of ban from the government. So I mean, yes, it's not like uh, it's not like showing uh, showing Palestinian flags or Palestinian symbols is a crime, but then you could be targeted by the judiciary, the police, etc. So even yeah. then, there were smaller smaller marches, and that is, I think, consciousness is arising. Uh, so.
we just think that we are doing a small part. I mean, we're trying to do our small part in this. And uh, thanks a lot for coming. And uh, we will like probably get back to you in future. So all power to the Palestinian resistance. May they um, like may they win. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm, thanks a lot to you. Thanks a lot to Dalal. Thank you. For